Okay, so it is. And Jennifer just arrived. Oh, perfect. Great, so then they have to come up. Okay, uh, I started recording. It is 4.06, and I will call roll. Susan Prant. Uh, here. Jennifer Schreiber. Present. Rebecca Dumichel. Present. Brian Cook. Present. And Kevin Knapp. I do believe he is going to attend. He's just not here yet. So no for Kevin. And Robin Ronan. Present. And turn it back over to our chair. Okay, so uh, next on the agenda is the approval of the September 21 minutes. Does anybody have any changes? Does anybody need more time to look at them? Okay, motion to approve them. I move. Do we have a second? We do, I'll second that. Okay, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, anyone opposed? Okay, um, the next item is approval of the commission's meeting dates. So I see on page seven, we have the parking commission meeting dates, but I don't, no, page, no, seven, page nine. Um, oh, TDM and Parking Commission. Okay, I'm sorry, I read it wrong. So if you go to your packet on page nine, uh, and just any questions on that and or anything stand out as something you absolutely know you can't make. The so January 18th, March 15th, May 17th, July 19th, September 20th, and November 15th. I'll, I'll have to double check the November date, but I think everything else. Okay, okay yeah, it's hard for people not that far in advance. Uh, do we have a motion to approve those? So uh, just a quick qu question, sorry. If we sure. know we might miss one, is there a recommended, like the May 17th date for me, for example, is a strong maybe likely no do we just if there's a quorum otherwise well it's fine to to not be there or would you prefer this early to try to move it i just don't know what you would suggest so i'll i'll chime in yes yeah, certainly if there was if we knew we would not have a quorum i would suggest that you would enter, entertain um directing staff to reschedule. But if we can, if we feel like we'll still be able to have a quorum and I'll leave it up to you to whether you wanna um, work around that uh, scheduling conflict. Okay. Um, did we, we had second, right? Jennifer second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Did people vote in favor? Okay. Uh, public participation. Do we have anybody from the public to participate, Lisa? We do not. Okay. We'll move on. Consent agenda, which is in your packet. Um, I'll give people a chance to go to it. It's on page, uh, page 10. I only have one question. I think I remember some comments that a number of the um, restaurants that were in the outdoor dining pilot didn't immediately join the the new during COVID. Didn't immediately join the new one. And maybe you commented then that there wasn't any usage of that program in Boulder Junction. I just was curious if you could remind me if that was true. That no, there's no 
restaurants or other businesses using the outdoor pilot in Boulder Junction? That's correct. Correct. Yeah. For the initial round, no business applied in Boulder Junction. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, otherwise, anyone in Boulder Junction off of the main thoroughfares is eligible to apply at least, right? I think it, they were in the service area, the speed limits were low enough, et cetera, that they could go through the next round of applications if they want, if they were interested. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the next round opens February 1. Got it. Ryan, I'm not sure how many restaurants are in Boulder Junction that do not have some outdoor seating of their own. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know like Zeal has the patio and et cetera. Zeal so. has the patio. Um, the depot obviously has a large patio in the, right. in the space. Um, you know, the coffee shop and um, I can't remember the name, but over in Steel Yards has outdoor seating. Um, I where the pizza place used to be and Griffin like has a little bit of outdoor maybe so. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Thank you. I didn't have Thanks. any other questions about the consent agenda. Um, can we get a motion to approve it? I don't know if we need it. Do we? Motion for the consent agenda. Uh, okay. Correct. Yeah, no actionable items in the consent agenda, but if, yeah, if there are no more questions, we can move ahead in the agenda. Okay. It sounds like matters from staff. DK. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Over to DK. <laughs> hey, thanks so much, Sue, and great to see everyone again. Um, it's been a little time since uh, we've met. I think the last time we were talking was about, um, well, shared micro mobility, <laughs> of course. And then also dismount zones and and whatnot, and uh, so it's great to be with you again. And so tonight's um, presentation is is all about our e-scooter evaluation update. Um, you may recall that about um, a little over a year ago, uh, we included shared e-scooters as part of our uh, overall shared micro mobility program. So we've got e-bikes with B-cycle and now e-scooters too. And City Council directed staff to um, implement a pilot program for one year and test the efficacy of it to see if it was a good fit for our community. And so they said, yeah, go ahead and do this, but on the east side of uh, of Boulder. And so we said, okay, we went to town and we developed regulations and went under contract with Lime. And, and since then have been um, monitoring the, um, the aspects of the program. And so we've drafted an, an e-scooter evaluation report um, it just came out recently, um, as part, I think it was like last Friday. Um, and so, uh, that information is out there. So, uh, we, we presented to tab last Monday. And so being that you bet every two months, we wanted to get to you beforehand. Um, but we're here now. And so, or every other month, excuse me. And, and so we wanted to, uh, you know, make sure that we have time to, to talk with you, share our preliminary key findings from the report. Um, talk a little bit about next steps and then get some input from you on that. So with that, I will share my presentation. Okay, let's see here. All right. Can you all see my screen okay? Yep, yes. Okay, great, excellent. All right, so um, let's just move to the first slide here, and and again, you know, talk about the reason, the purpose for why uh, we are doing this shared micro mobility program to include both e-bikes and e-scooters, and you know, we want to provide a safe, equitable, and a sustainable forms of transportation to improve the quality of life, provide connections to transit and key destinations, and replace motor vehicle trips to reduce transportation-related greenhouse gas emissions. That's the bottom line, right? We're trying to shift trips from motor vehicles and provide alternative uh, transportation. I really don't like that word, alternative transportation, but sensible transportation, sustainable transportation uh, for people in, in our city. Before we, we started the program, uh, we developed several evaluation criteria. Okay, we're gonna do this. Let's see what are the important things that we, we wanna take a look at. Now there's several here. I'm, I'm not gonna go into all of them right now, but I will say that safety, um, was uh, a very important um, component of this. 
and as well as uh, well community feedback and sustainability. Um, and so we pay special attention to those in the evaluation report. And, and mode shift, darn it, they're all important. <laughs> and I'll be touching on um, some of those here this evening. But just take a look of, again, kind of where, we, where we've been and where we are and where we're going. <laughs> so it was back in October, 2020 when council said, hey, include e-scooters in the pro program. And then we did an RFP, uh, worked with a group of community members and uh, organizations and created a scope of work and Lime won that. And, um, and then we launched the program August 17th of 2021. And now here we are just past the one year mark and now we're sharing um, a lot of the preliminary key findings with um, all of these boards and commissions and stakeholder groups. And that's the list that you see um, in front of you there. And so um, following our sharing of the key findings, we're looking for input on our next steps. We're gonna fold all these, you know, we're gonna finalize all of our next steps into how we expand the program. Um, and we'll make those changes in the first quarter of 2023. And so what, what are we seeing out there? Well, it's a mixed bag. Uh, we're seeing both good and, um, and bad results. Um, the good stuff is that um, people are using them. Um, they're, they're all over the place. Uh, every road, nook and cranny has been traveled by an e-scooter and I'll be sharing some utilization data with you to kind of prove that. Um, they're using um, e-scooters for trips to school, trips to work, trips for shopping and running errands. Um, and then there's also an issue with um, how they're being parked. And so um, many times we'll find the e-scooters blocking a sidewalk or crosswalk. And, um, and that presents people, presents problems to people who are walking and particularly those people who um, have disabilities. And so the major themes, again, um, you know, looking at um, kind of the overall gamut of um, input that we've received, you know, we put out a questionnaire, we received over a thousand responses, um, which is pretty good for one of our city um, questionnaires. Uh, Lime has one too. Um, they received 175 responses that went that was from directly from their customers. And then throughout the, the course of the of the pilot program, we've had several inquire boulder reports, and we've got you know continual um, or ongoing direct contact with city staff. So the major themes, like I mentioned, the improperly parked e-scooters is the biggie. That's the big problem. Um, and then also abandoned e-scooters and ditches and creeks. And But then there's also this appreciation for the program, like I mentioned. It's a new and fun way to travel around Boulder. Um, people are ready to go west of 28th Street. Um, they want to complete their trips to other parts of the city. It's an alternative to driving. It's more convenient for them. Um, but on the other hand, people are not always feeling safe on our streets riding an e-scooter too. So a lot of folks are riding on sidewalks, which can be attributed to unsafe riding behaviors. And we'll talk more about that too. And, uh, but you know, ultimately, um, I guess to end on a positive note, it's new, it's fun, um, and it's serving both recreational and utilitarian purposes. So let's jump into the utilization here. So right now there are 300 e-scooters deployed in East Boulder. When we started the program, we had 200, but we have a demand-based cap formula, which regulates the number of e-scooters that are in that market. And so when we see demand over a, peer, a two week period and the, um, the rides per device per day are greater than two, then we're able to increase the, um, <clears throat> the fleet size by 20%. And so accordingly, we today have 300 e-scooters in, in the East Boulder market. Um, they've racked up 115,000 trips or 117,700 miles. Over the course of the year, when you take into account those winter months, we've seen about 1.5 average trips per device per day. The, shorts are, the, the trips are short, about one mile, 10 to 11 minutes. And um, we did a we calculated the greenhouse gas savings. Um, and what we did is we used 25% uh, of um, all trips taken would have displaced a motor vehicle trip. And that figure, that 25% is based on um, a statistically valid survey that Lyme produced in 2019, which resulted in, in, in that outcome, 25%. And so 26,000 pounds of greenhouse gas savings um, Basically, it's about consuming 1,300 gallons of gasoline, one way to look at it. 
And again, safety being such an important aspect of this, we've had four moderate to, to severe crashes. And in these, these cases, there the police um, were called, the ambulance came and they were um, brought to the hospital. And I say moderate to severe, um, incapacitating. If someone um, breaks an ankle or a leg or has a head injury, that's considered a severe injury. And, um, and so that was really kind of one of the criteria there. Let's document how many severe injury crashes have taken. There's been more, um, a total of 17 with four of those being moderate to severe. The other 13 were um, minor injuries, scrapes, those sorts of things. And um, not necessarily reported to PD, but were, but were reported to Lyme. Okay. And this is a utilization map here. This is all trips um, taking over the course of the year. And again, when I talk about that penetration of the entire East Boulder market, you're looking at it right there. Um, the darker colors um, mean um, greater usage. And that dark purple corridor, that's 30th Street, running right down there through Boulder Junction. Um, a lot of activity in um, that particular area right there, but they really are all over many of the um, arterial corridors and then um, are also utilizing the multi-use path system where they are legal, where they lock, where they are legal to ride. This map is really helpful to kind of understand the activity, the, the use. These are trip starts. So this basically tells us, you know, every time someone hops on a scooter, where they're coming from. And uh, you can see 29th Street Mall right there, kind of near Boulder Junction area. Um, there is a lot of use there. It's also, if I showed you an end trips map, it would look very much the same because the trips are only one mile. And so a lot of the trips result in that kind of activity center there, that shopping area. Um, and so what that does mean, you know, for 29th Street Mall is that people are using these to access goods and services. There's potentially an economic benefit of having this mode, being able to access these different places. Other points of interest here are um, our traditionally underserved communities uh, up to the north there. We've got four in the area, Orchard Grove, San Juan del Centro, San Lazaro, and the Vista Parkside Villages. Equity is a big component. It was ingrained in the beginning of the, um, the whole project, the whole scope of work. Um, and so it's been on our radar. We've been addressing it over the course um, of the year. However, participation in the accessibility, the affordability program has been low. And we think that's for some reasons, um, but we don't wanna make any assumptions quite yet. And there's more work to do with our um, connectors, community connectors and residents program to really kind of break down to see what those barriers truly are. So don't want to speculate with you tonight. Uh, and then the other points of interest here too are CU Boulder and I'm uh, sorry, the East Campus and then also Williams Village. There's a lot of um, activity occurring between those two campuses, and they're really trying to make their way um, west to the main campus. Okay. Now this here, this particular slide here is about mode shift. So if an e-scooter wasn't available, how would have you how would you have made your trip? So our questionnaire, which is not statistically valid. Um, points to about nearly half of people would have taken some sort of motor vehicle trip, either privately owned or a ride hail or a taxi. If you look at the pink box, that's walking. So in addition to replacing motor vehicle trips, we're also dis, uh, displacing uh, walking trips. It's obvious that e-scooters um, are a bit more convenient and faster to get to one's destination. So make no judgment there. And then we ask folks, um, where do they, where do the people like to ride? And this is a multiple choice answer. And you know, obviously the the green and the pink are popular. The green is residential streets and or bike lanes, and the uh, pink is multi use paths. Um, and so people also responded that they like to ride on a sidewalk. Well, technically, side riding on the sidewalk is illegal, but people do it, and they do it because they don't feel safe in the street. And that tells us about the need for protected infrastructure, um, and then also maybe re-examining some of the areas where people don't feel safe. And until we have that protected infrastructure, should we make it legal while keeping it illegal on pl in places that have high pedestrian volume? So again, kind of bringing us back to where we are. Um, 
we'll go to city council in December and share this information, share some additional proposed steps, share the input that we received from all of our boards and commissions, community members, and then we'll finalize those next steps, wrap it into our program for 2023 and begin to make those refinements. And so with that, we'll ask you a few questions tonight. And um, if there's any observations I could share, I'd love to hear it. And if you have suggestions to refine the, the shared e-scooter e program, I'm happy to um, take those comments tonight and also talk about next steps a little bit. Thank you. Do you want to call on people or should I, DK? Oh, feel free to run the meeting. Thank you. Okay. Um, Robin? Hi, Dave. Hi, DK. That, thank you so much. So it's actually very interesting. I enjoyed reading about it in the packet as well. I guess my, my question is, uh, first of all, two comments. One, I work at CU. I'm in my CU office right now. I had uh -oh. someone here complaining this morning about not being able to get their East to go West. <laughs> so I'm I'm very familiar with that. And definitely it's something that has been very helpful for our students access-wise, especially those who live over and on East Campus. I will tell you, I had this funny experience where someone left an e-scooter right in front of my condo for a week. And I think that gets at one of the major comments. So as a user of the e-bike, uh, the B-Cycle program all the time, one of the things I think that's extremely helpful is that you have to park it at a specific location. And the fact that the, and also I'm an avid cyclist. So the fact that you just have these e-scooters that are like left in lanes and so forth, I guess my question is, what technology are they working on? That they're either tracking these fast enough that they can pick them up or that they can force them that they have to be parked in certain designated areas to prevent these things from happening. I mean, for accessibility issues, for dangers to bicycles, to not having access to our, 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 our sidewalks, I love all the wonderful things on it. But if they could solve this one problem, I think that's what everybody has an issue with with the scooter. Yeah, I would, I would agree with you 100%. This is the, the, major, the major issue with the whole program. But it's inherent to the dockless model. Right. So the docked model is the B cycle where there's specific locations and you have to have that frequency of locations for it to work well. So mm -hmm. you know, and then also the density. Um, and so. Um, if a scooter remains idle for greater than 72 hours, it's supposed to trigger a message to Lime, who is responsible for rebalancing uh, and responding to all the e-scooters. They go out and then take that scooter and move it. Not saying there's never any outliers because apparently you've experienced them. <laughs> so I'm sure it's happened elsewhere as too. Um, that's good information for me to take back to the to the team. Um, <clears throat> so what they use though is there's a GPS device in there, each device. And so you can basically let the operator know how much battery is left in the scooter um, and then where they can be operated and where they can't be operated. We can also program to go at specific speeds in certain areas. And then finally, we can also um, ensure moving forward that they are parked in mandatory designated parking areas. And we'll do that in likely two ways. One, electronically through the geofencing. And what happens there is someone who has the app open, who is using a scooter, is not able to end their ride until they park in that virtual geofence zone. And what we'll do to augment that is also uh, create a signed and marked location in the street um, where so a, there's a visible <laughs> for the there's a vis you know visible location for the customer to where to where to put it. So I hope that does that answer some of your questions or how it works. No, I think that's yeah, that definitely yeah. answers my questions. To be fair, it might have been five days, but it was definitely <laughs> okay. sitting there. <laughs> No, it's, it's actually happened. funny because I was like, I know they're going to bring this up in the next meeting, so I'm definitely going to clock it <laughs> to see how long this sits in front of my house. But, yeah, yeah, right. No, I hear you. It's, it's good. You know, and each device actually also has a unique identification number and then also um, contact information. And so it, it's, you know, and it shouldn't be the responsibility of residents to go and report these things when you see them. But if people do, they're really good. Lamb has been really good and responsive to um, addressing concerns like within like the hours they have people on the ground that live here in boulder that are working on this and have a warehouse and whatnot but it has to be reported if it's not reported then it'll sit there and, and so that's part of the, the challenge but i think the designated parking areas 
um, would remain. That said, however, remember earlier on that um, your commission um, re requested that that the, the Boulder Junction Access District remain dockless. And so moving forward, we'd like to maintain that if that is something that um, the commission would prefer to do, continue to do. We're looking at shopping centers and activity zones um, like 29th Street Mall. Uh, basically, those are private property anyway. <laughs> we mm -hmm. don't necessarily have the right to regulate. Um, those are sometimes deals or agreements that are worked out with the private property owners. But for Boulder Junction being the public right of way, having your commission here, we can determine whether or not they should remain dockless or they should go to designated parking areas. Okay, I'm going to go next. Uh, DK, is that an answer you want today, or is that something that should go on our agenda another time? Um, you know, I don't know if there needs to be any, any sort of, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? proposal or recommendation, official recommendation. But if there is, if you if you think it would require some additional um, discussion to determine that amongst your group, then it could be a future agenda item. We do have time as we're you know working towards making those improvements in 2023. Or if today you have some preferences or leading one way or the other, be good to hear just some kind of the, some of those initial I guess I personally don't have a preference, but I'll leave it to others to say. So I just wanted to say that this is a great presentation, really good job with data collection. Um, how did you get this data? Oh, it's a good question. Um, this is, we have a program called Ride Report. And uh, okay, so this is the Ride Report that you and I have discussed. Yeah, exactly. This is a, so this is a third party platform. We have a contract with Dr. Cog, which is the Denver Regional Council of Governments. They have a contract with Ride Report. And so we get this pretty inexpensive um, software, well, inexpensive for us, software to use to basically track all of the data. So each vendor is required to have what is called mobility data specification. And it's a certain software within the scooter that um, will track where all these things are going in real time. It's awesome from a, a transportation planning perspective and from a geofencing. The technology is wonderful. It's really helped us manage this, this whole problem, this whole project. Yeah, it's a really good report. Uh, Rebecca. I was just going to follow up on some of Robin's stuff. So I will say, um, of course, I have no idea how long this option will remain available, but usually you can also tweet at Lime and they will come pick up scooters that are in the wrong spot or knocked over or anything like that. So that is one option as well. Um, if you don't want to necessarily go look up the ID or anything like that, snap a picture or tweet it at them and they will they will send somebody out. Um, the other part though, I will say that I do like support dockless um, with on-street corrals for parking. So I feel like it should never be more than like two blocks away for, for approved parking for Dockless scooters, um, B cycle. Obviously, the the docking stations are quite expensive. They usually have to require like sponsors to get set up. Um, in Austin, I lived in in a neighborhood that was just outside that perimeter of of B cycle. Um, but when we got scooters, all of a sudden, like people in my neighborhood could actually util utilize those. So, Rebecca, just to clarify, um, when you say dockless because then you all we also talk about having designated parking areas too are you thinking of maybe a hybrid approach for um bjad area yeah so i mean obviously it would be i i don't want the the parking areas to be part of the sidewalk for sure right because that's still a problem of they're they're in the way um it can be knocked over easily they should definitely be taking a spot on the street um versus where people walk um but it's okay to have some guidelines for like, hey, this is this is actually appropriate place for you to park. I just don't think it should be more than like, say, two blocks should be kind of the longest somebody should have to walk to find a parking mm -hmm. spot. Because if there's not a parking spot within two blocks, then you're already you're already like kind of degrading the service right. and availability. The, the, lost the density and the the frequency of the stations, and so you're saying if we did move to designated parking in the BJAD area, 
then yeah it needs to be it needs to be frequent um and it can can be combined with other stuff too right we could have more bike uh parking spots that are combined with lime scooters mm -hmm. but, right. uh, but on street facilities is what you're what you're saying yes, versus sir. the sidewalk okay thank you it's helpful Anyone else? I don't see any other questions. Sure. I, I um, okay, DK, thank you so much <laughs> for coming here and giving. Ryan Go has ahead. a comment. Yeah. Sorry, Ryan yeah. had his hand up. Um, uh, Ryan, thanks. go ahead. Thanks, Sue. I didn't see it. No problem. Yeah. Um, I, I thought the presentation was great. The safety record and the emissions reductions are really cool statistics. Yes. I think for the quantity of travel, compared to the, you know, having four moderate to severe injuries. I mean, that's, I think that's just a really good signal to the city that, you know, you can trust almost everybody to use these responsibly and, and um, with some fixes around the parking, like we're talking about, I'm sure that'll continue to get better. I, I think it's just a great sign um, for the program. The protected uh, infrastructure, I think using the e-scooter program to help advocate for protected infrastructure that benefits other modes is a really exciting tactic. Um, I, you know, I remember the original Folsom protected bike lane snafu. Um, oh, you were there? <laughs> <laughs> I I, uh, I saw it and then it was gone. Uh, anyways, uh, I think yeah. it'd be really, it'd be really cool to see. Um, it'd be really exciting to see more protected multimodal, um, you know, non-auto transit and having a program like the the e-scooter program be um, providing some momentum to see that happen would be would be awesome. Uh, one thing I was curious about from the packet was around the recycling. It talked about how many devices or scooters, I guess, were recycled. Is that a, a burden on the city or is Lime responsible for that? Lime is responsible for that. Uh -huh. They're Got responsible it. for all their equipment and then all the obviously the maintenance and then um, all of the rebalancing. Mm -hmm completely on them. Yeah, As a matter of fact, the, the city now takes revenue from um, a, from a per trip fee, which we're able to then collect and then build back into the shared micromobility program, mm -hmm. where in previous years, it had been the opposite, where we got into a position where our subsidy, I'm not saying that whether it's right or wrong to have a subsidy, but it was continually, continually increasing while our budget was getting smaller during the COVID era. And, uh, and so, um, now we've reversed that. And we've got a more um, sustainable uh, model. Yeah, got it. Financially sustainable model. Great. Um, as far as the the locations where the scooters are allowed, I think moving west to Folsom slash twenty sixth would be really. I, I don't know how much the area changing is on the table, but having it go to Folsom. Um, could make a big difference. There's a lot of additional dense neighborhoods just between Folsom and 28th um, that could benefit, as well as a lot of um, you know commercial office space, you know between Canyon and and Pearl uh, in that zone too. So mm -hmm. um, I think that would be exciting. Um, I, I know crossing 28th with the scooters is probably uh, you know people do it on bikes, so I guess that you already have the the track record there but um no ryan thank you for that and mm -hmm. it, I, you know it, it is our in, intention to our proposed next steps is to go west of 28th and and make this um hopefully make this a a citywide program mm -hmm. yeah with, cool with designated cool. parking areas listen i i put the link um to the share micro mobility webpage in the chat and as of last week, we've just uploaded um, the evaluation report, all the appendices, and then um, you'll see in there is, uh, you know, kind of laid out our proposed next steps now for the program. Mm -hmm. And that's at the, the very end of that, re of the evaluation report. 
Mm -hmm. Take a look at that. And when you when you go to the link, just scroll down past the which wheels go where and the dismount zones, and then you'll start to see all the documents. Great. Cool. Um, last question I had was just around pricing. Um, I've not used Lime before, so I don't know exactly what the pricing looks like. In your interviews with people in the area that have used it, um, I, I think there actually was something in the packet, but around the pricing, like is does the city have any control around what line prices rides at, or do you just have the ability to offer subsidies in some cases or to certain people? Probably the latter. Mm -hmm. uh, so right now it's a dollar to unlock a scooter, and then it's 37 cents a minute on the ride. Mm -hmm. And we've heard from folks that it's too expensive and others that don't seem to mind it. Um, the affordability program um, basically cuts that cost in half. Um, so makes it a lot more affordable. Mm -hmm. um, but at this point, Lime has to maintain profitability in order to continue its services too. And uh, so there, there is a price point. Of, I, I think they're trying to find, they're measuring the demand with the price. And obviously if the demand goes lower then something else has got to give, but they also have to maintain profitability. Otherwise they go out of business. Fortunately with Lime, um, they seem to be doing pretty well um, globally at this mm -hmm. point. Um, so not not so much of a of an issue of going out of business. A lot of these companies, when they first started, did go out of business. Mm -hmm. Companies were ate up by other companies, and some just you know stopped work, you know operating and like birds on the way out right now, uh, for example. And uh, and so there's a lot of volatility in the um, kind of the startup industry. And uh, and so now it's starting to settle out, and some of these major players are sticking around. And, and Lime is mm -hmm. thankfully Lime has been proven to be one of those. Yeah. Well, if you continue to hear feedback, you know if that ramps up as far as expensive, you know, I know the city's being very judicious about how they're approaching the program. Having a competitor to Lime could help, you know, provide benefit to consumers on the pricing front potentially. So. Um, I don't know what it would look like to have a second vendor in the city, but um, they have a lot more control over the situation, given that they know they're the only ones allowed. So um, maybe something to consider as the program grows. Okay, thank you very much, Ron. Mm -hmm. uh, Rebecca, do you have another? Oh, Jennifer and then Rebecca. And then sort of a time check, it's 4.43, so um, we have a full agenda. Okay, yeah, thanks, Sue. Um, real quick, I don't know if I missed this, DK, in your presentation, that um, it, are there any plans to expand the area east? And then I also just wanted to mention it being in favor of having um, like geotagged secure parking. I did notice that when I used one down in Denver, like I could not leave it on the 16th Street Mall. I had to go down the block and it was like, nope, you, you cannot leave your scooter there. So I know there are ways that we could, you know, create like, yeah, you need to bring your scooter over here. And because they are in my neighborhood, it hasn't been too bad, but I'm sure like all of us, I've seen like, somebody with a wheelchair or a little kid in a stroller, like the sidewalk is now blocked for them. Good. But Jennifer, I'm, yeah, I'm curious about the expansion east. Don't don't forget that one too, thanks. When you say east, do you mean west? No, I mean, sorry, I mean east of 55th. Oh, because they're allowed east of 55th right now. They go all the way out to 63rd, I think, right to the city. Sedge. There probably just isn't well, a lot of demand. Yeah, not on the map. Anyhow, well, maybe I'll try one out there and see what happens. And if it goes dead, okay. I'll I'll, uh, I'll get that. That's back all operating. Here. I think that it's just the uh, the demand out there is as you get into the less dense areas, the demand goes down, and so they may not be fulfilling or necessarily there may not be deployment zones out there because there's not a necessarily an, um, a destination or an origin. Um, in some of those locations, but take a look again, but that's in the border. And, uh, and yes, you know, we want to move to the mandatory designated parking 
um, not just in some of our sensitive areas like Pearl Street Mall and um, the University Hill area, but also some of these neighborhoods, because that's where a lot of our complaints have come from, from a lot of the neighborhoods of people parking on, you know, sidewalks or being left in front of someone's house, right, Robin? <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, hope that answers your question, Jennifer, and it's nice to see you. All right, I have Rebecca. just one question. Yeah, um, of the four moderate to serious injuries, were they all single vehicle accidents or were there other vehicles involved? One of them was a uh, had a, a, a motor vehicle involved. The other three were single on their own. Okay, thank you. Good question. Okay, uh, thank you so much, DK. Thank you very much for your time. We'll see you soon. Okay, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you again. Thanks, that was great. Thank you. Thanks, DK. I wanna note, uh, Kevin has joined us here. Um, at the municipal building. So we have a, a full slate of commissioners now. Um, on to our next item, Commis the commissioners will recall that a couple meetings ago, we identified $50,000 in EcoPass savings that we wanted to reprogram toward um, Boulder Junction activations. Uh, community vitality staff, including Regan, Lane, um, Justin Greenstein, our special events uh, manager, have been working with Boulder Transportation Connections on a proposal. And so we have some folks here from BTC. Regan, I'm not sure if you wanted to say anything before we hand it over to them. Um, no, not necessarily. Just that um, BTC, yeah, is prepared to give a presentation on a series of activations to be held in Boulder Junction in 2023. So I'm excited for you guys to learn more. I'll hand it over to Emily and Elaine to introduce themselves. Everyone knows them. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you, someone can allow me to share screen so that we can share our presentation. Um, that's you. Can you um, make Emily a co-host? That's me. I don't know how to do that. No, we got it. We got it. Okay. okay. Um, but thank you for all for uh, asking us to prepare this present presentation and for allowing us to share this information with you tonight. Um, I, my name is Emily Reddick and I am the TDM program manager for Boulder Transportation Connections and I'm joined by my colleague Elaine Erb, who is our sustainable transportation planner. So we'll be sharing this information with you. Um, let me make sure I've got it in the right mode. Let's see here. Is that showing up correctly for you yet? It is. Yes. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> um, again, um, so thank you for having us join this evening. Um, Boulder Transportation Connections, for those of you who aren't familiar, is Boulder's Transportation Management Organization. We are one of eight uh, TMOs in Colorado, part of the Dr. Cog region, um, Denver, um, Regional Council of Governments. Um, we serve Boulder businesses, and in short, we connect them with um, sustainable transportation resources. Um, in addition, um, you, what is unique to Boulder Transportation Connection is that we administer the EcoPass program in and uh, both the neighborhood and business EcoPass program in Boulder Junction. So we have a connection with the community. We we do outreach and we have been part of the community for um, several years now. So that puts us in a unique position of already being very familiar with um, the businesses and residences in the area. Um, what we're gonna share with you tonight is a proposal for five events throughout 2023. Um, we are, we would love to get your feedback. Um, we've taken the feedback that we've um, heard so far from this committee. Um, and we also shared this presentation with the Boulder Valley Transportation Coalition, um, which is a committee that includes um, City of Boulder Community Vitality members, transportation members, um, community cycles, B-cycle, VIA, car share, and um, um, Lime. So many of the partners who would be involved um, ideally in hosting these events. And um, we were able to incorporate their feedback and um, make some changes in, in scope and size of some of the events. So as you can see here, we'll be proposing two bike to, uh, 
walk and bike month events, um, both the winter and summer, uh, a clean air event and a uh, EV related event, and then also a big celebration in summer. Um, and one of the concepts that we wanted to incorporate was making these fun, but also action oriented. And we wanted to incorporate the transportation options that are available to employees and residences in Boulder Junction. So obviously the bikes, the, the Lime um, scooters, they're not part of the transportation benefits, but they're in currently in Boulder Junction. Uh, the uh, EcoPass celebration of, uh, of that um, availability for, in, for free for residents and employees, and then also the Colorado car share aspect. So um, we're gonna just dive into each of these events. And this is kind of a 30,000 foot view. Um, so just keep that in mind. And if you have suggestions or uh, feedback, we'd love to hear it. So Elaine will talk to you about our first um, winter Bike to Work Day event. Yeah, so I'm sure many of you are familiar that we have been celebrating Winter Bike to Work Day in this region for many years. And it's popular <laughs> with the cyclists. We're kind of there's always some that show up no matter what. They tend to be the more dedicated people. Um, if we're lucky to have good weather, we do get people out. We are considering maybe looking for um, a bike home station for Boulder Junction. There seems to be a lot of you know existence and interest already on the morning, and that would be coming up February 10th. So. Of course, on something like this, we'll be working closely with our partners. I think many people here know that Community Cycles does a lot to organize the local events for these. So we would be doing things in conjunction with them and then also an opportunity to get the partners out for people to recognize, you know, Community Cycles. I can learn more about biking all year round and how to do more commuting how B-Cycle can fit in, you know, Lyme, and hopefully some other walking and biking organizations would be involved with that. Um, obviously, we're not quite yet into the details on this, but we'll definitely have more as we get closer. Yes, thank you, Elaine. Um, so this would be the smallest of the five proposed events, just because being winter and knowing participation would be somewhat smaller. And that was some of the uh, feedback we received from the BVTC committee. <laughs> I always say that wrong. Um, so uh, the second event that we're proposing for April timeframe would be in celebration of um, and a commitment towards Clean Air Month in May. So this would be a transit oriented event. This the call to action at this event would be to try to make awareness of the EcoPass availability in Boulder Junction. And we'd also like to make it fun. Um, our partners at VIA would love to bring the electric hop and have that available for people to you know, get on the hop. And um, I don't know if we would take tours or if they would just get on and hang out. But um, yes, um, so we would, and we would also have other festive um, uh, pieces available just to attract an audience and, and make awareness of this event. So um, that is the second of our proposed events. Our third, Elaine, again, well, I'll hand it back to her our, <laughs> to talk about summer bike to work. Yeah. Actually, I'll add on to the other that um, we've recently had a meeting with RTD, who is very interested in joining us with any of the events we do. They're excited to do more outreach and just make sure people are considering getting back on transit. Um, June, of course, we celebrate Walk and Bike Month, and we are, again, looking at a, a summer bike to work day station or possibly more bike home again. With so much activity in the morning, we're feeling like maybe we don't need to uh, compete with that, but um, especially because there is a, a decent budget for this, that there's a lot more we could do with something later on in the day. And there's great proximity, as we all know, to bike paths and, and infrastructure in the area. So playing off of that would be fun and you know it'll just be yet another fun event during the entire month of activities thank you 
um, sort of the pinnacle event, but not the last event in the series would be a um, Boulder Junction celebration event. So this would be a large um, community, fun community um, focused event. Um, we would include the concepts of live music, food trucks, a beer and wine garden, games, tabling. Um, obviously, we still want to have um, all of our partners available there to be able to present information and sign people up. Um, this could be a really, ex you know, not only just to su um, support the transportation services, but all the businesses in the area. Um, so we could have gift certificates. Um, um, and giveaways of um, for all you know to revitalize um, the businesses in Boulder Junction. So this would be a really um, you know the big event that um, we would be marketing and promoting throughout the year um, at the other events as well. Um, and then last but not least, um, we did not want to leave out car share and that um, availability and the excitement with all these great um, electric vehicle incentives in um, both federally and state and locally. So the last event would be an electric vehicle week celebration. It might not be actually in the electric vehicle week. It might be adjacent um, to that week. However, um, we would, and we've, we want to partner with um, our other organizations to potentially have an electric um, car show. So um, this could be another exciting draw um, and uh, all the focus of all these events, uh, in addition to just bringing people to, to Boulder Junction and creating excitement about, about the transit oriented district and the benefits, um, the unique benefits that um, employees and resident, uh, residents receive there. So we, um, Boulder Transportation Connection is um, part of the Boulder Chamber and we have um, internal support to make sure that we can um, promote these events throughout Boulder. Um, so I think it, we can make this a very successful um, event series. So um, with that, I will stop sharing and I open it up for questions or discussion. Hey, Emily, to start us off here, I think this is great and super exciting. Uh, my question would be, is, is $50,000 enough? Um, I'm so sorry, it's a little hard to hear. Is, is $50,000 going to be enough for all these? Well, we would scale the events to the budget that we have. Um, so, you know, that we've talked about that a lot internally and also with um, our city of Boulder um, partners. And basically we will, um, we're gonna scale to the budget that, that that is available to us. I think it's great. I mean, from my point of view, we've been um, looking forward to these, you know, being able to do events like this for years to come. So say, uh, you know, let's, Let's allocate the budget necessary to get it get it done right. Maybe just one one side note too. I, I love the promotion of the local businesses, you know, including them and yeah. all these activities. I think that's um, it's a great partnership. Yeah, we'd love to include them in every. You know, obviously we want them to be sponsors of the. Um, bike to work day and involved and um, you know anytime we're doing these events and we, we can have giveaways as you know part of our promotion of the event we want to use that those local businesses um, with gift cards or um, other promotion towards them because you know it's been a rough couple years with the pandemic so we want to bring business back to uh, Boulder Junction. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, Sue? Hi. So, yeah, so I was I'm familiar with this because we talked about it. Um, I guess my comment is just that um, I'm asking you guys to please remind me of this, uh, like, in February. <laughs> well, actually, please remind me of winter in January, and please remind me of summer in February, because uh, the summer is months and months of planning. Mm -hmm. which starts in February. The um, the winter is not so much planning. I'll start it mid-December. It's not as much planning, but it's planning. But uh, but if we're doing a big event in on Bike to Work Day, 
Um, yeah, remind me of it so I don't schedule other things because things tend to get scheduled. So um, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and so we've historically had, you know, periodic planning meetings. So we would want to be included on those so that, yeah, we're at the table as as that planning process is happening. Any other questions or comments? So Robin? I, I, I don't wanna belabor the point now, but I'd be kind of curious to see how you got to those exact estimates on cost. I share Chris's concern also that it seems kind of low. They all seem really exciting and I wanna go to all of them. But I was just kind of curious of how we got this breakdown. So I don't think that this exact moment, but at some time in the future, if you could present that, I would be interested. Yeah, so one thing I'll share is that for the Pinnacle event, because we, we've been working with the City of Boulder Community Vitality team, we've been in discussion with them about, you know, the theme and concept and how we would potentially um, prepare a proposal for these events. And so they were able to share with us, you know, a similar sized event um, of of what we would be planning. So for that Pinnacle event, I feel pretty confident that we would be, that budget would um, be what we would need in order to, um, uh, the, the funds that would need to be allocated for that size event. The other events, um, we do have experience, BTC has um, organized quite a few Bike to Work Day events and um, we've worked with other organizations um, as well. So, you know, there, if there was an opportunity for additional funding, and that's something BTC could potentially, um, you know, look for throughout the year. Um, but if there was a potential, we can just increase the scope of what we're doing. But um, a lot of the, um, our partners would be volunteering their time because, you know, Boulder, uh, when, when it's B-Cycle or Car Share or Lime or Via, we're not usually paying those partners to be there. Um, so a lot, some of the funding would go towards promotion um, and marketing because that's one of the bigger um, hurdles in getting the word out there to the residents and specifically. Um, I feel like with businesses, we usually have a pretty solid contact at each business, but with residences, we're normally onboarding people for EcoPass, but you know, actually getting the word out to individual residents can be different. So we've actually been talking with B-Cycle about some different um, electronic methods that we wanna try out for this upcoming year to increase our presence and increase the awareness. So um, yeah, I think um, I, I do, I, I understand the, the concerns. Um, we, we had those as well, but we've looked through and, and if um, we, we're happy to prepare um, budgets. I, if, if, oh. I assume there's a ton of due diligence that went into it. I was just curious actually of how, how you come up with those metrics. I want to, and I, I want to make sure it was so. It was Kevin's comments, uh, not mine. Uh, I guess it was probably just some. I, I should have mentioned my name. It's my, my fault. Um, <laughs> but I also, you know, I want to be really clear with the commissioners of making sure that you remember that we're reallocating monies that were budgeted for another purpose. And so the the more that we suggest we want to spend, then the more it turns into Chris Jones looking for a new job uh, event. Um, so uh, fifty thousand dollars is our our typical contracting spending limit where we have some discretion to reprogram dollars to do something like this. Um, and we also, as um, Emily was suggesting, you know, thinking about the Boulder Creek Festival and Parks and Rec's sponsorship of that is they spend less than $50,000. I think they're in the $30,000 range, but the, the event uh, planners have the the capacity to get sponsors. So I think Kevin from Element, or you're not, yeah, yeah. Kevin, Kevin has uh, suggested maybe they want to sponsor uh, the. Uh, no, I want to sponsor. Uh, yeah, yes. All right. So, yeah, we're not, we are certainly open to the BTC team uh, securing outside sponsors, whether it's cash or in kind. And Emily did uh, speak to that. So I think that, that these can be really uh, um, uh, great first starts. Um, and then in the future, we can certainly approach you all and city council in actually programming uh, resources on an ongoing basis, basis specifically for that. And if it's determined that we need more money, um, we would do that through the regular budgeting process. 
Yeah, and I'll just chime in to say we, you know, BTC has been around for a while and, and we've been nimble in very many ways. So we have in our past done outreach events. Maybe they're a little smaller, but, you know, we, we've known how to do some things with virtually no budget. So having a budget, as Emily's indicated, it allows us to do a little more marketing, to offer more incentives that help get people in and, and would I think create a more successful event, but we wound up in August going ahead and doing something with partners and, you know, it wasn't huge, but actually everybody walked away saying that was a success. So it, it, it's great to see that. And just when we can bring all these people together to, to offer a range of options and information, people are often really interested because maybe they're familiar with they've done the B cycle, they hadn't tried Lyme, they haven't signed up for their car share. So there's almost always something that people want to learn more about. Show and tell is always more fun. All right, I think. Great. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Elaine. Thanks so much. All right, moving uh, forward in our matters for staff. Yeah, thank you so much, BTC folks. We'll look forward to um, more help. Um, we are working on the development of our 2023 work plan internally right now. So this is just a heads up to uh, the commission. We'll be presenting our 2023 uh, uh, work plan more formally at the January meeting. Um, but just wanted to give you all a heads up of some things that we're contemplating that uh, have relevance for the Boulder Junction area. Um, and want to just remind you all, we have three primary ongoing work divisions in community vitality. Um, this is a cultural vibrancy, includes our arts and culture work group and our special events work group. And they'll be very much involved um, in this conversation around activations in the Boulder Junction area. Um, uh, our, we also have our district vitality or district management. Uh, work and so Regan and Lane are very much involved in that um, and so they're focusing on our capital project uh, the wayfinding and branding work and so we're hoping to to make some progress on the physical implementation of the you know, district branding and wayfinding in 2023 so it'll be a major work area and also partnering really closely with planning and development services on the TVAP uh, or Boulder Junction phase two um, is how it's been rebranded. So I know that was a huge priority for the commission in 2022. That work is beginning. Um, there have been a number of presentations at the city council. Um, and so we'll look forward to, to partnering with um, uh, the planning development uh, services department in that work that will translate into hopefully some more progress in some of the other focus areas that uh, you all have been communicating over the, the past few years, including uh, a 10-year plan um, and an overall capital plan uh, moving forward. So we're wanting to really uh, tap into that planning effort to um, envision how we might propose um, our long-term uh, spending plan, it, what that will be for the existing district and how maybe um, our district might evolve um, as planning development services is envisioning what can happen um, on the east side of the railroad tracks. Um, in the Boulder Junction area. So more to come, but I uh, just want you all to, to get kind of a preview on that. Um, and then, of course, in our Access for All, our, our Parking and Access uh, uh, Work Division, we're going to continue to work on our AMPS implementation. Sam Bromberg, who came to you at the last meeting to share with uh, share all of her work, we're going to um, really uh, make sure we've done a good job on cleaning up all of the data in the Boulder Junction area so that in 2023, we will have some specific recommendations uh, for performance-based pricing um, and residential access management um, around the Boulder Junction area um, later in 2023. Um, let's see. And then last but not least, it, you know, it's interesting that our RTD wants to be involved in um, uh, events in the Boulder Junction area. We certainly want to be working with transportation mobility and in, in um, uh, highly encouraging RTD in all the ways that we can to restore service 
in Boulder Junction so that we can uh, get transit back. It's one thing, you know, it's lovely. We can provide eco passes to everybody, but if there is no meaningful service, then it doesn't really um, uh, uh, mean a lot for what we're trying to do in shifting trips. That said, we have contracted with um, Fox Tuttle, um, uh, transportation uh, uh, engineering and, and uh, a long time uh, on-call contractor for the city to do another analysis of trip generation in the Boulder Junction area. They are doing their data collection right now. And so in 2023, um, we'll be um, able to bring the results of that work and, and provide an update on where we're at in our trip um, generation uh, goals for the, the district, which will then translate into a conversation about what more could we be doing to uh, uh, meet our goals. Because I imagine, especially with RTD being with where they're at, we're not going to um, we're not going to be at a space where we're we're meeting our trip generation or trip reduction goals in the district. So that's kind of the high level. Um, uh, elevator speech long. Uh, it's a very high, a tall elevator um, of the, the 2023 work plan as it applies to uh, Boulder Junction, but wanted to just uh, give you all a heads up. Happy to entertain any questions or we can move forward to the next item. All right. Hearing none. Um, we are, let's see, in your packet, we have the commissioner recruitment questions for um, both commissions. There are two questions that we currently pose to folks who are interested in volunteering to, to be on the Boulder Junction Commissions, and we would love uh, commissioner feedback on whether or not we they're the right questions or they should be tweaked, or we need to add more questions or uh, rewrite them entirely. Um, so really would be glad to open up. I think I'm, I apologize. We are, we will be getting page numbers on packets, but it's the very last page. Um, as the current questions, and we'd love to hear feedback from commissioners on, on any edits. Thank you, Robin. Jennifer? Yeah, this is a process question. Is it proper protocol to put comments into the chat or is that not something that we're allowed to do? That is a really good question. Um, I would prefer, I think we would prefer for them to be verbal um, just because if... <laughs> You know that, uh, yeah, it, it, if there was somebody who was watching this meeting later, I'm not sure that those types of comments, you, we could see all of yours, Robin, it did pop up on the screen. So I think that does get recorded, but the longer they are, then the less um, folks are able to see if, if they want to review this recording later. So verbal is certainly preferred. I think Sue's hand is up, but... Sue. Um, I guess I'm wondering, let me get back to it, um, if there can be, not sure how to word this, but it would be interested to see people's ideas on reducing parking or reducing cars instead of just better meet the, I mean, I, I agree with meeting the multimodal access, but um, but I would like to see how people think we can get people to drive less, which is kind of the flip side of that. I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, how do we get people to actually use these garages less? So, but does that make sense? Sure. We can take a look. It sounds like a, you're suggesting a, a tweak to the first question, not a not yeah, a new... yeah, not a new question or something. But you know, if if um, I'm thinking more of the answers, but if there was, if people were saying, well, we should, you know, limit the amount of parking with each resident, which I think we do, but um, or maybe somehow reward people for not having a car in some way, that would be good. So. I guess I just want to make sure that we get a nod of 
of three commissioners from both commissions on that direction before we start. Thanks. I'm seeing lots of lots of nods. Um, so I, I, are we, we're all we're all good. Everyone agrees with making a, a revision that great. Thank you. I have my hand oh, raised. Sorry. I don't know if you can see it, but I'll yes. jump in. Um, that I wanted to, a little bit in line with what Sue was saying, maybe I wanted to, instead of saying multimodal, let me get the language exactly right, multimodal access needs, I just feel like this is, and maybe some of the newer commissioners would have thoughts on this, I feel like that's very jargon. If I had no idea about this, I would just be like the whatever, the, they would just fly by. So I wonder if we can say sustainable transportation goals and then name transit, bicycle, walking, um, so that that, like if we wanna invite more members of the public in, then people could read that and be like, oh, I'm actually interested in that thing. So I would request that or suggest that change in both for both commissions in the first question. Is that is it clear what I'm suggesting? I see some nodding. It's clear to me, yeah. Clear to me and everybody in agreement with that suggestion. Seeing lots of nodding. Great. Rebecca, you've had your hand up for a little while. Yeah, no worries. Um the first is a point of of language, um, is it, should we be asking about both commission to each commission? I, I don't know if I've quite understood the question. Should we ask, be asking the same questions of so, each commission? So quite, yeah, no, well, no, question five actually has, how can the parking commission and the TDM commission better meet this when it is an application for TDM? So, you know, um, not everybody applies to both. Some, sure. of, us, some, of, some of us accepted, but, um, you know, that, that might be a little bit confusing, confusing if somebody is applying yeah. to one, they might not have a clue about the other one. Um, but then my other one would be an addition of a question. And that would be more for them to outline what their experience with the district is. So beyond, um, you know, just being a resident or employee, like, you know, have they visited it? You know, have they walked through? Have they gone to restaurants or businesses? Um, really just, I, I wanna make sure that people who are making decisions about the district actually have some experience with it. I'm seeing some nodding. Um, we can certainly take a shot at, at framing a question um, along those lines. Thank you. Have you taken the bus to the district? Because if you answer yes in the last year, that's probably not quite right. <laughs> there is local, there is still local transit. Oh, yes. <laughs> the hop gets there almost. Almost. <laughs> All right. Any other feedback on questions or suggestions for additional questions? Hearing none. Um, last item from staff is a follow up on um, matters from Commissioner from the last meeting. Uh, Commissioner Dumachelle had asked about um, installing no idling signs. I followed up with our climate initiatives team. Typically, uh, if we were to have an idling policy, it would be led by um, the climate initiatives folks and the environment. Environmental Advisory Board. City does not currently have a no idling policy. A number of cities in the state do, but Boulder does not. Um, and there uh, are a variety of reasons why, and there's a broad spectrum. Some of the cities do have 
a no idling policy of you know, no more than you know 30 seconds. If your vehicle is idling for longer than 30 seconds, you're in violation. Some is upwards of 15 minutes. Um, and so uh, I don't know that it's currently a priority for our climate initiatives. And then the other element is the uh, concern about signage and enforcement and the amount of greenhouse gas uh, emissions that would be associated with the actual implementation of uh, a policy to discourage folks from idling without the, the um, enforcement teeth to really actually make the, the difference that we need to make up for the, the environmental impact of uh, a new policy throughout the city. So that's currently what I heard back. I promised that I would uh, follow up on that item. Um, and so we don't have any no idling signs um, in the city or a no idling policy to, to sign to. Um, uh, and I just wanted to, to follow up on that. Can you elaborate on what the environmental impact of establishing a no idling policy so, would be? Uh, the, the actual installation of uh, fabrication and installation of signs throughout the city um, does take, a, it is a, a financial resource and a production fabrication. Uh, you know, we'd have, we'd hire folks to go out and dig holes and, and um, put signs in. Um, that is not a small feat. Um, we, we do have a sign program at the city. Uh, and so that would, be associated with our transportation mobility sign shop and the work that they do, adding a whole new realm of signage responsibility for the public works team. Um, that's one consideration as to why it's not currently a high priority for climate initiatives. It doesn't mean that the, the that might not um, change, but currently it's not something that they are um, pursuing. Is it is there an option to not? I mean, you could have a policy citywide, but you could maybe have a specific like enforcement or policy for certain districts. You know, we already have parking enforcement in Boulder Junction, right? So there's there's one avenue there. Um, there are existing sign poles for the parking signs, like pay to park signs, right? So that would be one way to avoid. Some of the digging and and new metal for for the pull aspect, right? The sign itself would still have to be made. Sure, I understand your interests, and I would suggest that maybe a better strategy would be to implement electric vehicle parking only, or something like that. That is maybe a bit more. It achieves the end that you'd like. Of the only folks that would be parking there would not be. Um, uh, producing emissions uh, without another, you know, realm of enforcement need that's really subjective. I mean, you know, depending on the amount of time that, um, that we would attach to such a policy, then we'd have another enforcement layer. How do we, how do we determine how long, or do you have somebody standing around for 10 minutes um, to see if a vehicle has been idling and, and what's the utility in that for our overall um, enforcement program versus are there other strategies to get to that same end where cities that do have these idling policies actually don't do a there there's not a ton of enforcement um, because because it is challenging to catch somebody in the act and it's more of an education component mm -hmm. of, of it's against the law um, don't do it um, and people still do it um, and so the, producing a lot of signs not necessarily get the, getting the behavior that you want anyway and then it's just one more layer of frustration as opposed to is there a different way we could manage the curb that reduces uh, the, the issue in the problem areas. I think, you know, Meredith Street in Boulder Junction is an example of that. You can only park on that shared street if you're an electric vehicle, otherwise you're parking somewhere else. And so maybe it's uh, something that we would want to explore um, in a problem area is uh, installing electric vehicle charging station and making it the, so that only electric vehicles can park there. Okay. I think that's something that climate initiatives would definitely probably be very interested in pursuing. Is this just this one street that Rebecca's been complaining about forever where cars are right in front of people's windows? I mean, that, that's my 
primary thing, but I think for the whole neighborhood and for the whole city, we should discourage idling, right? Yeah. And, and, and for the most part, people just aren't thinking through it. It's not like they're being jerks to be jerks. They're just really not thinking outside their windows about what's going on. Yeah, because I almost feel like, I mean, I feel like if I lived there, I'd just put up the sign on the post. <laughs> Don't idle, you know. That, somebody did that. And did it work? City took it, the city took it down. Uh -huh. Did it work while it was up? <laughs> um, possibly, yeah. Um. So if I can jump in, I'm sorry, I have my hand up, but I think I have my little Colorado gift day background. It makes it really hard to see I have a hand up, but I'm, I'm not sure uh, Chris or city staff if, or, and other commissioners, what everybody would feel about this is to encourage the city to consider anti-idling and to offer this to the climate group. I mean, maybe I'll just do that as a citizen. I don't know if how complicated or meaningful or if it's even in our scope for us as commissioners to advocate, but idling has in general, not just in our district, but throughout the city has a huge environmental and climate impact and local air quality and health equity concerns. So um, I'm a little surprised to hear that Boulder doesn't have an anti-idling policy. I appreciate the points about enforcement. I, I hear you on that. At the same time, I think it's a, a, a climate, a transportation, climate, air quality, health equity strategy that that we somebody in the city, us, we should be considering. Sure, and I certainly would never discourage you from, um, as a you know, as a Boulder resident, from pursuing those um, ideals. And I would say that that um, as a district, I totally can appreciate the the suggested work item of of maybe there's a district related policy um, that we could explore as part of part of uh, the health and well being of the district. But I, you know, I want to also right size uh, uh, the work plan for our teams and, and tackle what we can tackle and would also want to think creatively and would much rather I'd feel much more compelled to try to partner with climate initiatives on uh, electric vehicle parking to mitigate maybe a, a, a hotspot issue um, while they're while the, the broader topic gets addressed citywide. Um, unless there, we're at a spot where we're not making progress there and, and the commissions of, of all of our general improvement districts uh, feel like this should be a, a priority, then um, we can do that in work planning over time. I just posted a link to a document of all the places where these exist. And you know, and I don't, I don't want to come across as advocating, but I would say that you know the best way to reduce idling is re eliminate the car trip altogether. Um, and so it's it's the you know how where do we want to spend our time and energy of of trying to reduce emissions from folks who are already in the uh, the vehicles, or do we want to spend our time and resources on um, things that pre prevent the trip in the first place? Uh, well, Chris, you know, I'd, I'd rather just eliminate those parking spots. Um, with the EV option, what would be the nut stops there? Um, Climate Initiatives has an electric vehicle charging station program. Um, and so uh, I can certainly follow up with Matt Lehrman um, in Climate Initiatives and see if there's an opportunity to maybe focus on uh, additional installs in Boulder Junction. And if there are opportunities for that, targeting them. Um, in front of the nickel flats. Okay, um, I will say that there is one right across the street, so I don't know if that will affect it. However, it is very well utilized, so. Good to know.
All right. Um, Elaine, you've had your hand up. Would, ha would happily hear from you on this topic. Yeah, I wasn't sure if if I I was allowed to weigh in or not, so raised my hand. But I just wanted to concur. I you know this is a huge huge pet peeve of mine. I'm primarily a walker around town, and I have previously done work like picking up kids at schools, and it feels to me like if Boulder Junction could be that progressive entity within the city that said, we need this. I think it's really important because parents are even idling at schools with little kids who are the most susceptible and not having an ordinance keeps people from recognizing what an issue it is. And it's a vehicle, a standard contemporary vehicle at 10 seconds of idling beyond that they're better off turning off an engine you know i'd love to see us put in a two minute ordinance 10 10 and 20 seconds even 30 is kind of low but you know two two minutes it's recognizable i have approached individuals i've gotten the mixed results sometimes you know young people that just weren't thinking are like wow i didn't realize that thank you you know and then there's the others but when there's some teeth behind it, you know, because we're not all going to be driving EVs in the next five years even. So, you know, something that helps people recognize why you have to be more thoughtful when you are driving just, it, I think, is a meaningful motion. So just want to share that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um... There's no more discussion on this topic. We can move on to managing commissioners. Uh, and Sue, I'll hand it to you to uh, lead us through the rest of our time together. Oh, is it me or Kevin? Well, it's, uh, you, you're welcome to pass the gavel to you Kevin. You can continue facing that here, so I appreciate you uh, taking okay. the reads today. All right, let me go back. Uh... Okay, now Mio's next commission meeting is the 4 p.m. on Wednesday, January 18th. Sounds good. And I guess motion to adjourn. Wait, sorry. Hold on. Oops, wait. Ryan. Thank you. Um, are we doing council letters? Go ahead. Oh, that's a really great question. So um, given that uh, we are at the midterm, for the council that was elected um, last year. They are not asking for letters from any boards and commissions in advance of their uh, midterm retreat. So at this point, uh, no letters are being solicited from any boards and commissions. Okay, thanks. Um, is there any opinion from other commissioners on whether our priorities that are listed in the packet should change be added to be have anything removed as far as before we go into next year you know Ryan, i have one comment on that i uh not necessarily the the priorities themselves i think uh when chris mentioned the items on the work plan i think they they pretty well aligned but the one thing that has been on there for a few years now that we haven't really tackled has been the um the tenure plan and the capital improvements plan. And you know, I think without you know, maybe picking a meeting or you know, somehow prepping for that in advance, it's just that it's kind of a big item that's going to remain there for a few more years before we get to it. So maybe just a um, request on my part that, that that's on the radar and that we can uh, make some progress there next year. Makes sense. That's it for me. Sorry. Thanks, Sue. Take it away. Oh, no worries. My my computer went out when you were, so I didn't really hear your question, but then based on the answer, I got it. Um, so does anybody have anything else? Nope. I see a lot of no's. So the motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion. I'll second. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. See you on, I believe it was January 18th. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks so much, everybody. Happy holidays. Thanks. Me too. Be well. Bye.